So the first question that was received from one of our participants is asking if there are any nutrient runoff or leaching measurements that were done as part of these studies. Yeah, thank you, Leslie. As part of our value of manure studies, we are not looking into runoff or leaching, although we are going to be looking into uh, efficiency and sustainability indicators like nutrient uh, mass balances. So we're trying to see how efficient we are being in the amount of uh, nitrogen P and K entering each field and how much of that is being taken for the crop and then to see um, how efficient it's, the system is. All right. Um, and if they, and also that's, pro I think it's probably the same person asked if they are track, if you're tracking phosphorus in the soil. Uh, yes, we are. As part of this, we also do general fertility uh, samplings. Uh, so we are tracking phosphorus to see uh, the effect of manure application and also the initial levels of phosphorus for application of manure. All right. Thank you very much, Juan Carlos. Um, Tibor asks, and I think this is a really interesting question that is purely, I, you're going to speculate because it's all you can do, um, he agrees that these experiments are really important so that farmers better, better utilize their nutrients, but he asks, how would the results be different if you were in, say, Alabama or maybe California uh, compared to New York? Yeah, so Tibor, uh, you should be able to answer that question better than we can, right? <laughs> Um, so one of the things that shows up with uh, with our, our trials is that the history of those fields is really important. Um, that will in, impact so any of the trials, no matter where they are. Uh, one other thing that we should point out here is our our agriculture is not irrigated, so there will there will likely be some impact of, of irrigation versus non irrigation in terms of these results. It highlights the importance for um, many other states to join and conduct these type of research trials. And it's, it's really great to also see that now developed with proposals being submitted uh, to try to get some trials in the, in the Chesapeake Bay states. Thank you, Corrine. Um, so John asks, when collecting manure from different types of herds, was there a record of what the feed, the feed source that they, those animals were eating? Um, he says, in doing some rough research in southwest Missouri years ago, the, it seemed like the type and amount of the feed affected phosphorus and potassium levels, which I think we all are, are familiar with and that nitrogen was all over the place. He was just asking, you know, if you asked those questions before you did those sampling. I think that is a Carlos um, question, correct? I, um, so I, I can take that one. Um, okay. <laughs> so uh, we were trying to get a larger database of, of manure samples going. The, the focal point was to look at the variability of the, of the numbers and see how often do we need to analyze to get accurate numbers. How, how variable is this altogether? We did not go back to the farms to, to connect that to rations, but um, we have animal nutrition colleagues working on several of these aspects, uh, particularly the nitrogen uh, link between the, the, the rations and the excretion in the manure itself. So there is work being done on this um, this aspect. Um, it was not part of what we set out to do in this particular project. Okay, cool. Um, so are you or have you seen any or ex maybe even expecting to see any differences between the the raw manure and the digest state? Um, yes, we have seen differences and we're expecting to see those differences. And I think that's why it is important to work with different types of, of manure in our database. Uh, Digestate has more inorganic nitrogen, so the hypothesis is that more of that nitrogen is going to be rapidly available for the plant. And uh, as part of our studies, we see how much nitrogen is going into the ground, and then we see how much was used for the plant. So we are interested in looking at that for the different manure types. So is the digest state more variable or less variable than manure, though? 
than raw manure? Is it more consistent? Um, so um, uh, I was, uh, my question was uh, connecting to the value manure projects. Uh, in, in that one, we are testing digestate. In Carlos's project, I believe there was no digestion as part of the manure viability one. Uh, my hypothesis is that there might be less because it has been digested, so it might be more uniform. But I think we need to actually go there and, and, and test the variability. Yeah, that's what that's what I was wondering. Like, I would expect it to be more consistent, but I don't yeah. know if that's truly the case or not. I, that would be interesting to find out. Um, this person asked, "What about the concentration of carbo?" carbonates uh, and other salts in the liquid manure system and how that impacts yields of crops. So that is uh, not something that we looked at in this study. Um, it is it is very clear from, from the trials that uh, manure is a good thing. <laughs> there, was, uh, there was no negative impact in terms of, of yield responses. Um, we couldn't share it in in this webinar either, but we looked at forage quality as well. And uh, in, in general, the, the manure applications benefited the crops. Um, we haven't measured uh, any, any salts or carbonates in the manure itself though. Okay. Um, Myra asks how, and I think this is to the point of Carlos' presentation. He, she's asking, how frequently would you recommend sampling? Uh, have you been doing this long enough to come up with that recommendation and how often you would and could average those? So, yes, um, that's going to be the pen in each farm. But we, as I said before, we recommend like doing like a frequent um, under, um Samplings, because this can uh, vary of everything. It can be uh, can vary it from rainfall. It can be rain. It can vary it from also wastewater and everything that we are doing, like all the management that we are doing in our farms. So it's gonna also depends on uh, uh, like um I I wait I wait to explain it. Like I think here in New York we have like a when we are going to apply it, it's like one or two times that we have to please bring help me like one or two times that we have like to sample it right but yeah. that's yes. not gonna like give you give us like an overall perspective of what we have in our farm like we we like really try to tell people like please uh, test your uh, your manure so you know what you have and you know what what are you gonna apply and also it's like you you and based on those results you're gonna have a better perspective to uh, to take decisions. One of the things so our farms that are our regulated farms have to test manure at least once a year. We cannot use book values here in New York. And I think that uh, anecdotally also when we were sampling the manure. Uh, sometimes you can see how it changes, the, the dry matter especially changes, and then we saw that though that correlated with changes in nutrient composition, so if you are ex expecting a change in dry matter, it's good to take another sample. Uh, if you are doing some manure transfer from one lagoon into the other, that's probably going to affect manure composition as well. So after any of those changes, it's good to test manure, and I think dry matter gives you a, a good idea of where when manure is changing. Mm -hmm. We also have a similar regulation that you mentioned, Corinne, that they have to do it um, at least once a year for the regulated farms. Um, yeah. However, I mean, the, the way that says is once a year is sufficient. And the reality is yeah. that's probably not sufficient because you probably should be doing more than that. If you're applying more than one time a year, you definitely need more than one sample. So um, more frequent is better, but realistically not as you, you can't do it constantly or you would be, right. well, you wouldn't have any manure. <laughs> but so. based on what we're seeing uh, now, it's it, it looks like, you know, if you have a spreading event of a, a week or two weeks to, to spread it out during that spreading event, mm -hmm. um, make sure that you capture when there's major dry matter changes because that will impact your allocations as well. For sure, for sure. 
Um, this person, uh, this is an interesting one related to the um, to the soil health one. Do you have any comment on carryover of microbial communities? And I assume this means from one year to the next with and without manure and how that might affect uh, nutrient availability in subsequent years. Yeah, in about a month. <laughs> well, you'll know that in about a month? <laughs> <laughs> it, it is part of the questions that the that we asked ourselves. Um, so uh, there was the, the sites that we started in 2023. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Juan Carlos, but I think all three of them are in 2024. So with the three timings again. So we should we should be able to comment on that. Uh, we just don't have that just yet. Just not quite ready yet. All right, good. I we'll, we'll look I, for a follow-up at some <laughs> point then. Great. I um, should add that Caprita is also working on DNA extractions uh, so that we can get a sense of what kind of populations are in the soil and which ones are stimulated by timing of the year or manure application and carry over. All right, so this is a more broad scale question for for you. Um, Gabby asks, I've heard that small dairies are decreasing across the US and maybe, maybe that's true for your New York, maybe it's not. Um, have you found that farmers are having a harder time sourcing manure if they don't have the livestock themselves? Or is there an abundance of manure and people not using it? That's definitely more broad scale question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, here in New York, our average animal density is on the low end compared to a lot of other states. So our farmers here tend to have the land base to allocate the nutrient resources that come from manure on their own farm. There are farms with higher animal densities that are looking at export waste where manure is exported, for example, turned into compost and compost is exported off the farm to horticultural businesses and stuff like that. Sometimes there's some, some land swap between neighboring grain farm and and a dairy farm. Um, last time I, I did a survey uh, among farmers, uh, there was a great recognition of the value of manure and uh, farmers didn't want to give it away. So mm -hmm. it's uh, they wanted to use it themselves. And uh, you know, the, the results of our projects here presented today is, is showing where that value is coming from. So, yeah, if you don't have a livestock operation and you want to get access to manure, um, you will have to look around, see if there's any neighboring farm that can share it with you, and is willing to share it with you. Those answers are going to be very state specific and they will be very much driven by what type of industry we have, how mm -hmm. much land base does that industry have. Um, in New York, uh, our state balances are actually pretty good, meaning we we have the land base to recycle the nutrients and manure alone is not enough to meet the needs of our crops statewide. I would say we're we're similar in that respect. We have more land than than we have manure in many cases, um, though there are definitely pockets where there is more manure than there is land. There's pockets uh, here in Nebraska as well. Oh. Um, do you have this kind of leads into that or leads from that? Do you have like a manure brokering? system in New York? Is there a way to, to get between for the crop farmers to access manure? Is there, you know, we have some, we're starting to see that industry develop here in Nebraska where crop farmers go through a broker to purchase manure instead of through the, through a farmer, directly from the farmer. Do you have that there? I don't think we do. Okay. Uh, I don't know if Juan Carlos, if you've heard any, any difference, but I, we have custom operators yep. that, that work with farmers to apply the manure. Yep. Some and of our custom custom applicators sort of serve as that broker in some cases, but not not always the case. Sometimes there's an actual separate entity, which is an yeah. interesting deal here. Yeah, I think it's reflecting that we, we don't have the accesses that um, might be there in some other uh, animal sectors or, or mm -hmm. uh, geographic areas. 
Um, that low animal density is really key. All right. Um, so Kathy mentions that when she was looking at dairy manure samples in Ohio that was submitted to the Department of Ag there, the range of data was all over the board. And she's thinking that could be due to guidance on how to thoroughly mix lagoons prior to sampling and, and how to properly sample. Is that an issue that you dealt with? I mean, I'd like to think that your program probably knows how to do those things. Um, but I mean, is that something that farmers regularly have to deal with or that you, you hear about happening? Is that an issue with the variability still? So mixing lagoons is inherently difficult, but there is equipment out there that can do it. And those of you that attended the Manure Expo either in past years or this year in New York, uh, will have seen some of that in action. The, the, the thing we keep reminding people is it's better to take those samples closer to land application. Mm -hmm. So, because that's what's going on the land. Not the average from the lagoon, but what you're pulling out at that moment. Um, so maybe it's not that important an issue to know how to sample a lagoon. Maybe it's more important to uh, figure out how we can get more accurate samples, some more, more representative samples closer to the timing that it goes on the field. All right. All right. So um, this person asked what if ammonium nitrogen was measured during the manure variability study. She was thinking it would, he or she was thinking that it would be less variable across the manure storage level uh, as with potassium. Not certain that I would agree with that, um, but I would I would love to hear what the, the speakers have to say about that. Ammonium, in my experience, has been very variable. <laughs> so yeah, yes, the, the, go ahead. Yeah, okay. The, the ammonium, yeah, was it was measured for the manure uh, variability study. We measure uh, also. Uh, both organic and inorganic uh, nitrogen, but we wanted to like show us, uh, sh uh, like in a overall perspective, we wanted to show how it will look because we have. Uh, I don't have like the data set right now, but yes, uh, the ammonium is a, a little bit more, a little bit more stable. I wouldn't say that it's totally stable comparing to the like potassium, but it will like uh, look a little bit more. Um, valuable if brain or Congress women out something. Well, go ahead, Juan Carlos. Yeah, I, I am. I think at some point we, uh, I don't have the numbers on top of my head as well, but uh, we were seeing what were the drivers of the variability and if some of them were connected. And we saw a little bit of a connection in some farms, not in all of them, between dry matter and organic nitrogen. So the dry matter was changing, uh, the organic portion was changing as well, probably because it's connected to the solids, uh, while the inorganic section wasn't uh, moving as much. So for those farms, uh, we saw that the inorganic section was more stable, um, while the organic one was connected to dry matter. Out of all of this, it, it, even all the inorganic, organic, Measurements as well were pointing towards the same thing. You gotta take samples. More samples, more samples. Yep. <laughs> no. Um, going back to Corrine, what you said earlier about get waiting until as close as you are to land application to take that sample. Kathy's asking, um, how do you get that data back from the lab in a fashion, or do you use last year's data? What is what are the implications of using last year's data and not having yeah current data when you're applying. Yeah, um, so that's definitely a, a, a drawback from sampling as close to application that you, you get the results after you've applied it. Um, but um, what a lot of farms here do is keep running averages. Um, sort of take take the results from last year, combine it with the results from this year, see how different it is. If the farm makes major changes, then that's probably not a good way to go. Um, most of the labs that do manure analysis will have a fairly quick turnaround time. Um, but 
yeah, building some sort of a, a record for the farm itself and getting confidence in you know, what sort of averages am I getting for this farm and how does it change over time? It's difficult if, if you start building a record, it gets a lot easier if you have a couple of years of manure data already. And that's what we want to work towards. Yeah, that's that's what I always say too. You know, you got to use, use what you've got. Uh, you go off of that and then you adjust. I don't know, you're in, you're in the same boat. You said you've got less manure than you need for cropland. So you're ending up supplementing with commercial fertilizer. And so that's the way you deal with that. You supplement with that commercial fertilizer then for, for what you're still missing. Uh, hopefully you're not over applying by using the, <laughs> the last year's nutrients, you know, yep. probably better off to sh shoot a little under for that respect. So that's, um, that's great. One comment in that uh, sense is that the farms we were working with asked us for the uh, manure lab reports and they came fast enough so they were able to use them for the site dressing decisions. So even though it was too late for manure decisions, then the, the um, site dressing was based on those uh, yep. manure reports. Yeah, very good. Very good. So a more basic question. Um, Someone asks, why does agitation impact nitrogen concentration in manure? Does it increase it or decrease it? I think it, it, it primarily impacts the distribution. Like if you have more solids in that sample versus more liquid, liquid portion versus the solid portion at the bottom of a storage could be quite different in nitrogen. I would say it maybe increases losses from volatilization. If you've got a lot of ammonium in there, you would lose that during that agitation potentially. Correct? You could lose some, yeah. 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 All right. And then this person asked whether you sampled um, for HPAI when you were when you were sampling or if that was, I know it's out of the scope of the project for yeah. sure. Uh, right. just, uh, we, since we you were not. manure sampling anyway, <laughs> did you happen to do that? No. <laughs> All right. All right. And then Kathy is asking more about um, whether you land applied according to phosphorus or nitrogen. Yeah, so, so our, um, our value manure field studies use one rate and we were targeting the nitrogen value of the manure so we were shooting for a rate that was estimated to be a little less than what we needed so that we could get a response curve um, in some cases we we did get that in other cases there's a couple of sites where uh, we didn't need it so it was not it not it was not a trial to set up a comparison of p versus n based application rates. This was a targeted study to see what are the nitrogen credits coming from those manure applications compared to um, plots that that didn't have any manure in, in applied. We do have some work on um, n versus p based management uh, that was published several years ago. Trying to figure out what the what the what the trade-offs are, um, and we are currently also a partner in the dairy soil and water regeneration project that is nationwide, where we're looking at some of these trade-offs as well. Phosphorus-based management. What are the nitrogen credits coming out if you do that? Uh, so we have work ongoing on this topic. Um, it was not part of the projects that we presented on today.